And Mr. Kennedy, I appreciate your time. So you're Jeff Zeleny going through the role that Jill Stein played when you just look at the, the, the vote tallies in the state of Wisconsin. Um, only need 2,000 votes to get on the ballot in the state of Wisconsin. So what do you say to Democrats who point to Jill Stein and say, that's going to be you? Well, right now, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, who I pull more from in November. Right now, I'm pulling pretty much equally, probably a little more from President Trump. Uh, like, I, you know, as you pointed out, I want to pull from both of them. But, um, you know, do you want a, like, kind of a, thought, a glib answer or a thoughtful answer? I'd always prefer thoughtful. Okay. I mean, what I would say is you have both sides... I'm um, using scare tactics. Republicans say that if Joe Biden gets in, it's going to be the end of the republic. Uh, uh, Democrats say if Donald Trump gets in, it's going to be the end of democracy. And I don't think either of them are actually going to destroy democracy. There's, we have institutions in this country that are pretty enduring. Um, and if you look at both those candidates, they're very different in their temperament. They're very different in their ideology um, their, and in their rhetoric. But on the issues where they actually depart from each other, it's a very narrow band of issues. And it's the culture war issues like abortion, guns, the border. And they're all important issues, but they're not existential issues. On the existential issues, neither of them has the capacity to address them. The biggest one being the debt. We now have $34 trillion in debt. The service on that debt uh, is more than the, uh, the our military spending. So, and within five years, fifty cents out of every dollar collected in taxes yep. are going to go to servicing the debt. And who ran up that debt? It was President Trump and President Biden together in just four years each. They ran up more spending than all the previous presidents going back to George Washington combined. The chronic disease epidemic. When my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60% is the biggest issue we have. $4.3 trillion that we're spending on that. And it's four times, almost five times our military budget. And it's getting worse and worse. You've never heard President Trump talk about it. You've never heard President Biden. The polarization in our country, again, existential. All of these issues, AI, and neither yeah. of them has the capacity to deal with these. And all of those issues are created by a system of corporate capture, this corrupt merger between state and corporate power that has absolutely subverted and undermined our democracy. And neither President Trump or President Biden has the capacity to address it because they're part of that system. They're both being financed by BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, the military contractors, the pharmaceutical industries, and that system just spits out bad policies and the illusion that if you differ on culture war issues, it means you're you know, radically different. But the real issue, things that we need to do to save our country, they can't do them. And if you vote for President Trump or President Biden, they both had their chance. You're going to get more of the same. If, any, if somebody needs, if somebody actually wants change, wants to actually alter those issues, they're going to vote for me. And, and yet to be president of the United States, if, if, if you have to be on the ballot in enough states to be able to win the Electoral College. Oh. You're not right now. Yeah, and, and, I and will be. You, and you, you, you believe you will be? You believe, I mean, because I know- oh, I know I you, will be. I, 100%, I'm going to be on the ballot in every state in the District of Columbia. We are, you know, Eve, yes, we, and I've said this from the beginning, and we're already well on our way there. I think with eight, within eight weeks, we're going to probably be on another 19 states. So we were not allowed to get on the ballot before in most states because we didn't have a vice presidential candidate. You have to name a vice presidential candidate to get on the ballot in about 26 states. So now we have that. And we have we have about 200,000 volunteers. We're gonna, it's gonna be easy for us to get on the ballot in every state. So I know part of the reason that- In you North get... Carolina, we had to get 13,000 signatures. We got 23,000 in New Hampshire. They said it would take us months to get our signatures. We got them in one day. In Utah, we got them in one week during a blizzard. So, you know, we're not going to, we have a very, very good volunteer army out there. So when you talk about that you had to have a VP candidate to get on in some yeah. of these states, right? So that's part of the reason I know you made this decision when you did. The person you've chosen is Nicole Shanahan. Um, she's a lawyer. She doesn't have government experience. 
uh, obviously not a household name, and a lot of people have questioned why you picked her. Liz Smith of the DNC just today um, says she was picked for one reason and one reason only, the money. And obviously she speaks for the DNC, but uh, Mick Mulvaney, who was uh, OMB director under President Trump, said this. There's one thing we need to know about her. It's the reason that uh, Kennedy picked her for vice president. She's fabulously wealthy. This is the woman who single-handedly bankrolled his ad during the Super Bowl that cost $4 million. That's why he put her on the ticket, along with the fact that I think everybody else probably turned him down. Would you have picked her if she didn't have the money? Yeah, did you see her speech? Part of it. But I, I mean, I'm just asking, I mean, did you pick? I, I, mean, I don't think anybody who watched that speech would ever say that. She was you, impressive. She's eloquent. She's authentic. Her life is the, it's the template for the American dream. She started out as a, a minority kid in Oakland, extraordinary poverty, on food stamps, on welfare. She grew up and attended Stanford. Well, she became a Stanford fellow. She became an entrepreneur. She's a very, very uber successful businesswoman. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of AI. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of chronic disease epidemic and how to stop it. She is young and she's a mother. And I wanted, in my candidate, I want three things. One, somebody who was not an insider. Some, because it was the insiders who created this problem. They created the debt crisis. They created the addiction to war. They created the chronic disease epidemic. They created the polarization. I wanted somebody outside who's thinking outside of the box. I want to, our campaign is for young people. We are, you know, we're the only campaign that is looking at this assault on our children, on what is happening to this young generation. So I wanted somebody who is young, who is not, you know, an 80 year old man. I wanted somebody who's a mother. I wanted somebody who's going to champion their issues. And, if I, and I don't think anybody who looked at Nicole Shanahan's speech which I urge people to do, would ever say that the reason that I picked her was for her money. By the way, we don't need her money to get on the ballot in every state. We already have the biggest field operation of any campaign. We are going to have no problem getting on the ballot in every state. We did not need Nicole Shanahan's money, and we're getting plenty of money. We're raising more money. Our campaign is. And President Trump or President Biden. Well, so when, when you talk about, though, that you say that you're pulling equally from both. Now, we'll see what happens. But in the polling that we uh, have, I, but hold on one second. You, it, it, I'm going to just take Georgia because we all know okay. Georgia margin of victory yeah. last time was 11,779 votes. So the latest polling from Georgia, you get 12% of the Democratic vote. You pull 5% of the Republican vote. Again, these are polls. This is where we are right now. But that's, that's, when they, that's what they show. So when you look at it that way, how can you say that your campaign is not taking more uh, from what Biden? I, what I would say to you, and you know, um, I'm not, this isn't something I want to argue with you about. It's just what I'm, my observation is, and I don't care one way or the other, what, what my observation is of the Quinnipiac poll, the Harvard-Harris poll, the Gallup poll, the New York times Siena poll, all the leading national polls at this point in history as of today show me polling like maybe two more points from President Trump than I am from President Biden. So I'm mainly what they're, what they're showing, and the Politico did a big article on this, is my supporters are people who aren't going to vote at all, largely, and my donors are people who had given up on the American political process and are re-engaging because they feel that they don't want to choose between the lesser of two evils. They want to choose a candidate who is going to inspire them, who's going to give them hope, who has a vision for the future, and who has the vigor and energy actually changed this country. And that, you know, those, those, I want to engage those people in the political process. You, the Democrats and Republicans, I'm going to take from the margins. And I can't tell you, even today, it's irrelevant, Aaron, because it's really, what, who am I going to take from in November? So you, in, in 2000, um, Ralph Nader obviously was running. And you did an interview with NBC News just a few months before the election. You said this. There's a political reality here, which is that his candidacy could draw enough votes in certain key states from Al Gore to give the entire election to George W. Bush. And then you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. You wrote, Ralph Nader is my friend and hero, but Mr. Nader's candidacy could siphon votes from Al Gore. 
Mr. Nader dismisses his spoiler role by arguing there is little distinction between the major party candidates and that Mr. Gore is compromised on too many issues. While I admire his high-minded ideals, his suggestion that there is no difference between Mr. Gore and Mr. Bush is irresponsible. A moment ago, you said you, you essentially see Trump and Biden as the same. Different, different issues. But do you really believe that when people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is, is this an equal yeah, evil I mean, to I, Biden? I, I mean, listen, I can make the argument that President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court that shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. The greatest threat in democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to open a portal and give the access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS, to CISA, to NIH, to censor his political critics. President Biden, for the first, first president in history, to use the secret, his power over the Secret Service, to deny Secret Service protection to one of his political opponents. For political reasons, he's weaponizing the federal agencies, those are really critical threats Donald to democracy. Donald Trump, of course, tried to overturn a free and fair election. He tried to overturn one, right? He's, he's still fighting in court. Yes. He's a, how is that not a threat to democracy? Well, I think that is a threat to democracy. If he, he, him overthrow, trying to overthrow the election clearly is a threat to democracy. But the, the question was... Who is a worse threat to democracy? And what I would say is, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question, but I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. Adams and Hamilton and Madison said, we put the guarantee of freedom of expression in the First Amendment because all of our other constitutional so, rights depend on it. If you have a government that can silence its opponent, it has license for any atrocity. So it, just to be clear, you're saying you could make an argument that President Biden is a worse threat to democracy than, than Donald Trump. That's what you just said. But who else has so, ever tried to, who else has ever tried to send, what president in history mm -hmm. has ever tried to censor political opponents? What president has weaponized the federal agency? You know, when my father came into the Justice Department, the first week he was there, he, he got all of the branch and division attorneys together, and he said, whatever we do, we are not going to use the power of the Justice Department for well, political Trump, reasons. Well, said that and he would do that. He, is, he has said that he well, would course, do that. Of course, and that is reprehensible. And he is the only president who's tried to overthrow the results of an election. Well, you know what? You know, let, me, let me say something about that. I'm not going to defend President Trump on that. That was appalling. And there's many things that President Trump has done that, that are appalling. But in 2001, we had an election stolen in this country during the Bush Gore election. In 2004, I wrote an award-winning article for Rolling Stone that showed how that election was stolen from John Kerry. So I don't think, and most Americans agree with me about 2001, that it was stolen election from, our, from the Democratic Party candidate. So I don't think people who say that the election is stolen or not, that we shouldn't treat, we shouldn't make pariahs of those people. We shouldn't demonize them. We shouldn't vilify them. What we should be doing is saying, let's all get together, Republicans and Democrats, and fix the election system so that it cannot be fixed, so that we're the exemplary democracy of the world. We ought to, you know, Las but Vegas, let, that, let but, me tell you this, Las okay. Vegas is built on machines that can count and never make mistakes. Should, can we can we make an a, a election machine and can we have an electoral process? Mm -hmm. And but every American says all whatever the data, happens, okay, hold on, it but cannot when, be, it can't, it, can't be, it can't be fixed. I understand that <laughs> we want elections to be as perfect as they possibly can be. Yeah. And one should not use the fact that the election was not stolen and was not cheated to not try to perfect it. I understand that distinction. But when you do as you're doing and you open the door to well, we want every machine. You're opening the door to people who can say, well, then that's exactly what I'm saying. The machines miscounted, the machines did this, but they didn't. Every single analysis has shown that that did not happen, right? As you know, 
Do you worry that you're opening the door for well, people I'm, to I'm, believe I'm, this? Look I'm, at the Republican I'm, primary I'm, voters and that they believe. I'm not, I'm not worried. I, that never, Trump I don't worry about how people might misinterpret my words. I, what I said, I mean, and I'm careful about how I use language. So I'm not saying that that election was, was just, that there was cheating. I've never said that. What I've said is that there are problems, particularly, Aaron, if you, if you don't have paper ballots. The, ele- the election machines can be fixed in various ways, and that's just a fact. What we ought to have is we ought to have machines, and we ought to have paper ballots at the same time, and we ought to have a very low threshold to get a recount of the paper ballots. And that just makes sense. It's common sense. But we, you know, if we implement that in every jurisdiction, you're not going to have problems where Americans at each other's throats I mean, so you're talking about a technical thing, like instead of having one half of 1% be the trigger for a recount, you would put it even lower. I mean, that's that's the sort of reform well, you're talking I, I, about here. Whatever. I'm not, I'm not choosing a particular threshold, but a threshold that makes sense. That's a very low threshold where you get a recount if you, you know, if you, if there's some question. So, uh, you know, and that's, I, I don't think this is, I'm saying something that's controversial. I'm saying something that I think most Americans, virtually any American, would agree with, let's have an election system that even 10% of the Americans who are crazy people, that even they won't question because our election system is the best election system in the world. And nobody, you know, I mean, Vermont, for example, has a very, very good election system. Nobody ever questions the Vermont election system. And we ought to be able to do the same thing in every state. We're, we are supposed to be the template for democracy in every country in the world. Let's make sure we put a man on the moon. We, you know, we've had all these accomplishments. Let's make sure we have a system that nobody is questioning, even crazy people. People are always going to question it, though. Well, They're okay. always going to question it. And that, it, you, it, you want to narrow the margin of people who are questioning it to as, as much as possible like, by, by giving nobody any kind of legitimate claim about it. And that's all I'm saying. And what I'm saying is not saying, I'm not saying that President Trump won the election or that President Biden, and I've never said anything or suggested anything like that. All I'm saying is let's focus on the issues that bring people together. Uh, than constantly focusing on the polarization, on the issues that drive Americans apart and have us all at each other's throats with this very, very toxic polarization and demonization of each other. I want to ask you, I I mentioned uh, at the top of the program how Trump was trying to tie you to the far left, right, with his recent post, most radical left candidate uh, in the race. I guess this would mean he's going to be taking votes from Crooked Joe Biden, which would be a great service to America. I love that he's running. Obviously, the Democrats were putting up uh, billboards outside your rally, tying you to MAGA and to Trump. But there, it's very interesting over time, over the past six months, when you and Trump have spoken about each other. I wanted to play some of those times and, and give you a chance to explain. Here it is. I will say RFK Jr., who I've known not very well, but I've known for a while, and I respect him. A lot of people respect him. The people who support Donald Trump feel that they're regarded by the elites as deplorable people, and that, you know, they're not part of our country. And I think Donald Trump made them feel like they were part of our country. That He's a very smart guy and a good guy. Well, I'm proud that President Trump likes me. I was most curious, actually, about your last statement there. What about President Trump liking you makes you proud? Well, here's the thing. And first of all, I'm, I'm definitely the only candidate running who has sued Donald Trump twice and won the lawsuits. And, I, and so, you know, if Donald Trump, does, Donald Trump does a lot of things wrong, and I call him on it. But, I, you know, I, I, I try to be a candidate who's not running on rancor, who's not running on vitriol, who's not running on personal attacks, but is running, you know, based upon my record and and based upon my ideas on the issues. Now, here's, I mean, here's how, let, let me explain to you how I view this issue. I think there's a revolution happening in our country. And it's the same kind of thing that happened when my father was running in 1968. The, the polarization, the division of Americans is the most toxic it's been since the American Civil War. That is gonna, there's a whole group of 
people in this country, the American middle class, 57% of Americans who can't put their hands on $1,000 if there's an emergency in their family, for those people, if the engine light comes on in their car, it's the apocalypse. You know, they're going to lose their car, lose their job. They're feeling forgotten by the Democratic Party. They used to represent the interests of the middle class. They're feeling forgotten by the entire political establishment. Donald Trump came in in 2016 and said to those people, yeah, the whole thing is fixed. And that's what they wanted to hear. Populist movements can either be harnessed by demagogues for dark reasons and with, with using all the alchemies of demagoguery, or they can be captured by idealistic leaders and idealistic reasons. My father captured most of the white vote in Maryland, uh, uh, Delaware, and the Eastern states just before his death in 1968. Four years later, those same people voted for George Wallace. Why is that? They were populist. My father captured them, that energy, with the powers of, and the How cause of idealism. How would you describe yourself? Are you a populist? Are you a I, nationalist? How would you describe yourself? I would describe myself as a populist, but it, like my father was a populist, and a populist for idealism, for, for the America's greatest, our signature values, for democracy, for free speech, for constitution, for a democracy that's not run and captured by corporate interests, anti-war, um, and for the middle class, for the cops, for the firefighters, for working people in this country, about rebuilding our middle class, about making sure our kids have, are able to live the American dream. There's, you know, the American dream when I was a kid said, if you worked hard, if you played by the rules, you could buy a house, you could finance it, you could take a summer vacation, you could raise a family, you could put something aside for retirement on one job. My kid, I have seven kids, Aaron, and none of them believe that that promise appeal, appeal, uh, that it applies to them. And why? And are they're sick? They're you know today. When I was a kid, juvenile diabetes, a, a pediatrician typically would see one case in his entire lifetime. Today, one out of every three kids who walks into his office is pre-diabetic or diabetic. Why isn't the political established? We're, we're spending more on diabetes than we are a defense budget. Why isn't the political establishment talking about this? We ought to be solving this problem. So Why are our health agencies never even asking this question? You just mentioned seven children. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm wondering as we sit here, and you're doing this interview, you're doing interviews, you're doing rallies, and, and you're running. The candidacy that you're running has cost you a lot personally. It has cost you um, siblings, family members have spoken out against what you're doing. They are angry. They're upset. They're hurt. Uh, your sister, Rory, was on our show recently, and she spoke about it. JFK's grandson also posted on social media overnight something. I don't know if you saw it. I wanted to play both of them. I feel strongly that this is the most important election of our lifetime. And I do worry that Bobby just taking some percentage of votes from Biden could shift the election and lead to Trump's election. He's trading in on Camelot, celebrity, conspiracy theories, and conflict for personal gain and fame. I've listened to him. I know him. I have no idea why anyone thinks he should be president. What I do know is his candidacy is an embarrassment. That's oh, your family. Respond. That's your family. Yeah, I have a big family. There's about 105 cousins on the last time we came. Roy's your so sister. I, yeah, and I have siblings who are supporting me. I have, uh, I have, uh, I have cousins and nephews and nieces who are working in my campaign. My campaign is being run by my daughter-in-law. My, you know, by our the political party that we started is chaired by my cousin Anthony Shriver. But listen. Well, I have a big family. I don't know anybody in America who's got a family who agrees with them on everything. I don't know if that's your situation, Aaron, if you just have a family who believes everything you do is, you know, like unicorns and rainbows. But, uh, for, you know, I, would, I come from a family, from a milieu, where we came home at night and ate dinner with my father, and he would uh, orchestrate debates between us, and we were in the same way that his father did with him. And we could disagree on issues, and, and we could disagree with passion and information, but we still love each other. And I love Rory. I love my family. I feel loved by them. 
listen, I understand why they don't like me running. I understand. President Biden has been a 40-year friend to me and my family. He has a bust of my father behind him on the Oval Office. Yes, he talks talking about, about how that. my father inspired him to enter politics. There's five members of my family who work for the Biden administration. So, you know, I understand why they're dismayed that I'm running against them. They're also worried that, you know, what my sister said, that, you know, my candidacy may get Trump elected. What I happens if it, it does? I what understand. happens if you wake up the day after the election, we have results, and that is what happened? Well, yeah, Will you regret it? What, 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 I, what I said to you applies to that. I don't think either President Trump or President Biden are going to solve the debt crisis in this country, which is existential. Yeah. I don't think either of them are going to get us out of foreign wars, this addiction that we have to forever wars. President Trump actually said he was going to do that, but then he appointed John Bolton. He said he was going to drain the swamp. He appointed John Bolton as head of NSA, and that's, you know, John Bolton is a swamp creature. He's a template for swamp creatures. Um, I don't think that either of them are capable of ending the corporate capture of all of our agencies, the capture of the CIA by the military industrial complex, the capture of NIH, CDC, and FDA by the pharmaceutical companies, the capture of USDA by processed food and big ag. They're not going to do anything about that. So it's going to be more of the same, whoever gets elected. There's going to be changes around the margins, you know, like that tax on abortion or whatever. Okay. But both of them only have four years, and I don't think they can dismantle democracy in four years. I think Americans' institutions are too great for that. And, and the chance for me to actually change the nature of governance in this country, to restore democracy, to restore our nation's moral authority abroad, have us a for, give us a foreign policy that's not based on war, war or projecting military power abroad, but on projecting economic power and moral strength. The chances of that happening are too great and too important for me to give up this contest. All right. Bobby Kennedy, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Aaron, thanks for having me. All right.